Our scripture is from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 10b through 18. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Picture yourself as a sheep in biblical times. You're part of a fold out in the wilderness, in a field, and you're protected by a makeshift fence made of stones that have been gathered and branches. A fence is constructed except for one opening, just an open space to go out and come in. And it's dusk, and as it gets darker, you can see shadows in the distance getting closer. And your intuition tells you this isn't good. And then, as it gets even darker, you see it's wolves. And they approach with malice in their narrowed eyes. You can see it, and you can hear them snarling. And just as you're about to panic, the shepherd stands in the opening, and the wolves run off. The shepherd is the gate. Good shepherds in that day literally would lie down across the opening to the fold to sleep at night. That's where they would sleep, in the opening of the makeshift fence. The shepherd's body forming a gate, the protector of the sheep. And the main difference between the actual shepherd who owned the sheep and a hired hand was just that. The hired hand would not do that, but the shepherd would. A sheep equates with dependence. Sheep are dependent on their shepherd. I remember a retired pastor in our conference, Dean Milford, sharing about a trip he made to the Holy Land. And in a field, he saw a shepherd demonstrate this, how dependent the sheep are. The shepherd had a staff, and he held the staff out, and he had the lead sheep leap over the staff, and then he removed the staff. And every other sheep coming after the lead sheep jumped over the thin air where the staff used to be because the lead sheep had jumped. Psalm 23, which we just heard a little earlier as the quartet sang for us, speaks of the shepherd leading the sheep to green pastures and still waters. And that even in the midst of danger or adversity, the shepherd provides. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Sheep are dependent. Like children are dependent. I remember when our kids were young, they loved to kick balls around the yard. And one place we lived was a front yard that had a corner, streets going two different directions. And we had to be really careful. Because if we didn't stop our three-year-old from kicking the ball into the street, he might get hit by a car. Little children especially do whatever we lead them to do. They're completely dependent on us. And it's no accident that in his epistles, John refers to his fellow believers as, quote, little children, unquote. Dependent. Now, seeing a flock of sheep, we might say they all look alike. They're sheep, but a good shepherd wouldn't say that. A good shepherd knows every personality trait, every marking, every mannerism of his sheep. 
Again, to Dean Milford in his trip to the Holy Land, he said a bus stopped, the bus that he was on stopped to let some sheep cross in front, and Dean heard the shepherd saying something to the sheep, but he was speaking Arabic. Dean didn't know what he was saying, so he asked the local guide, and the guide said he's calling them across the street. He's calling them by their name, one by one, across the street. Jesus is not a hired hand. We belong to him. Whatever your state in life, widowed, orphaned, broke, imprisoned, alone, whatever your state, you belong to someone. You belong to the good shepherd. In church groups and small groups, sometimes we'll play a game called the mystery person game. Everybody has a piece of paper, and each person writes down on the piece of paper without putting their name on the paper. They write down something I'm really good at, the thing I'm most afraid of, my favorite movie of all time, my dream vacation, what I want to be remembered for. Each person will write the answer to those questions down on the piece of paper, and then the papers will be put anonymously in the middle. And the facilitator will pick up a random piece of paper and read those characteristics and the rest of the group will try to guess who the mystery person is well jesus would win that game every time he knows us he knows you the good shepherd he says i have other sheep that do not belong to this fold i must go to them also they will listen to my voice so there will be one flock one shepherd but he acknowledges there are many folds. I think this is an acknowledgement of our God-given differences. It's one of the reasons we have various denominations of the church. We shouldn't lament that. We're different. But our differences should be subordinate to our unity in the one who unites us. Spiritually, we are one in Christ. And ultimately, we're all in this together. Christ's intention is for all folks to be part of one flock. Before Jesus came, the prophet Isaiah had said, The Lord will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the little ones in his arms and carry them in his bosom. Jesus fulfills that prophecy. He is God come to earth to feed and to carry and to protect the shepherd's decision to lie down in front of the gate doesn't mean the shepherd has no fear, but his care for the sheep is greater than his fear. The hired hand, on the other hand, lacks the care. Jesus says, I lay down my life in order to take it up again. Now, regarding the crucifixion, the gospel of John doesn't mean that Jesus went through the hell of the crucifixion stoically. And the other gospels make clear that there was fear and agony jesus prayed not only father let this cup pass from me but also in his moment of most agony my god my god why have you forsaken me jesus love for us was greater than his fear his trust in god was greater than his fear his obedience was greater than his fear a good shepherd cares what happens to the sheep. That doesn't mean he doesn't feel fear. The fear was real for Jesus, as surely as it would be for you or me. But by going through death, Jesus has conquered that fear. He was tortured and killed by human beings, but he was raised by God. So he's no longer a victim. And in him, joined to him by faith, we need not be victim to any fear ourselves, even the fear of death. Jesus is in front of the gate for us. And when protection requires it, he even picks us up and carries us in his arms. John's gospel, the way it is written, the last gospel written, reflects back on Jesus' life, death, and resurrection as all part of God's ultimate plan. But Jesus' death was not part of God's original will. But God's ultimate will encompasses even Jesus' death. Jesus' death could not thwart God's plan. 
Human cruelty may seek to thwart God's plan, as in humans killing Jesus. But human cruelty cannot ultimately succeed. So anytime you experience cruelty or you see cruelty, remember that it cannot succeed in the long run. God never intended cruelty, certainly not against Jesus, but cruelty cannot thwart God's plan of love for us all. Jesus therefore says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. The one who sent me is with me. In essence, he's saying no matter what happens, God will provide. Evil never defeated Jesus, even as he was dying. Even when he felt lost, afraid, abandoned, even in agony, his faith deep within told him God was with him. God would see him through, even through death. That's why at the very end, his last prayer is, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. It is finished. And now that he's made it, we can too. Since the shepherd has not been defeated by the wolves, neither will we be defeated by the wolves. If the shepherd were gone, we'd be scattered and snatched away, but the shepherd is alive, standing in the gate. We are protected. We can live free from fear in life and death and in life after death. Again, the prophet Isaiah said he will gather the little ones in his arms. Therapist Ron Greer is a United Methodist pastor ordained in our North Georgia Conference. And Ron lost a child to a traffic accident. And in the hospital, Ron was holding his dying young son as life support was unplugged in the hospital room. And he said, I want to hold my son I want him to know he's going from his father's arms to his father's arms. There are rules in our lives. Don't cower before the wolves in your life. Treachery, loneliness, misunderstandings, wolves. Pain, anxiety, uncertainty, feeling trapped, wolves. Depression, emptiness, financial stress, wolves, guilt, fear, despair. The coronavirus is a wolf. There are wolves menacing each of us. They growl, we'll rip you apart. Jesus stands in the gate and says, over my dead body you will. The wolves pace back and forth menacingly outside the fence baring their teeth, snarling, we'll make your life miserable, and then we'll kill you. Jesus stands in the gate and says, over my dead body, you will. What Jesus said he would do has happened. He said, I have power to lay down my life and power to take it up again. When Jesus was killed, it looked like the wolves had broken through and would get us, but they had not. Jesus was raised from the dead. He lives forever. The wolves of worry, fatigue, disease, fear, despair, pain may say, we'll get you. But Jesus is resurrected, standing there in the gate as our good shepherd, saying, over my dead body, you will. And the wolves shrink away because even when they thought they had killed the protector, God foiled their malice. The good shepherd is alive. Jesus is now living again. So when he says, over my dead body, he's saying it's impossible for any wolf to snatch us away because the resurrected Jesus cannot be killed. He lives forever. Jesus laid down his life to save us. Jesus took up his life again to empower us. So we are protected not just to survive, but to thrive. Jesus says, I'm here so that you may have life and have it abundantly. Psalm 23, not just I will fear no evil, but also my cup runneth over. 
Look and see Jesus standing there in the gate, invincible, and then stare down the wolves. If you accept Jesus' protection, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and commit to following Jesus Christ as your Lord, your life will be dominated not by fear, but by joy. The guilt you feel for your sin will be replaced by gratitude for Jesus' forgiveness. You and I weren't put here just to survive. We were put here to thrive. The Good Shepherd knows you by name. The Good Shepherd loves you more than you love yourself. So anytime in your life you feel wolves creeping up, anytime you feel threatened or scared, look at Jesus, resurrected, standing there in the gate. If you listen carefully, you can hear what Jesus is saying. To any wolf that threatens you, the resurrected good shepherd, who will never die again, says, over my dead body, I invite you to reflect on God's word. It's application to your life.